people on the floor, whether it's a restaurant or retail, should know better than anybody what's on that list or on the shelves. Talk to them and ask what's interesting and take a risk ultimately. Drink promiscuously. <laughs> Drink promiscuously. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and consider the source. Know where you're buying wine from. I don't think anybody goes to the gas station expecting to buy sushi and not feel sick later. If you want to try something new and you expect it to be good, go to a reputable wine shop that has, to Vanessa's point, people working there who have curated the wines who can help tell that story and help you navigate that. If you walk into like a corner gas station like your shop, it's highly unlikely that you're one, going to find what you like and two, find anything different. That's true. And when I'm in a good restaurant, I'll trust the server or Sam's recommendation of wine by the glass. I will try something, but not maybe at, you know, fast food joint or whatever. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 120. Are trends like orange wine and natural wine here to stay? What are the benefits of joining a wine club? How do you get out of a wine rut? And how have consumer wine buying habits changed during the pandemic? Our guests this week have the answers for you, plus lots of great wine tasting tips and stories. And I've got a bonus for you in addition to this podcast. I'd love for you to join me for the premier watch party of the video of this conversation that I'll be live streaming for the very first time on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube next Wednesday, March 24th at 7 p.m. Eastern. The video will show you the pictures and other visual elements that we discuss in the podcast. I'll also be jumping into the comments on all three platforms as we watch it together so that I can answer your questions in real time. It's like the Netflix version of the podcast. Plus, you can talk to me and ask me questions in real time as we watch it together, and you'll see what other people thought of this conversation and answers to their questions. In the show notes, you'll find a full transcript of our conversation, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m., including this evening and next week. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 120. Now on a personal note before we dive into the show, as Miles and I were driving home from Ayanna restaurant last night, the snow was quite blustery across the road. Wow, look at all those snow, what do you call them, squirrels? No, what do you call them? Oh, I love that. Snow squirrels, I said, delighted with his word invention that was so much more visual and descriptive than... I don't know, snow squalls. <laughs> As usual, Miles is so good natured, and now we've renamed those gusty tailwinds snow squirrels. Have you ever renamed something more aptly? Let me know. Now, if we could only come up with a better term for carbonic maceration. Okay, on with the show. Both of you, as I mentioned, are very highly trained. Vanessa, you're a new master of wine, 2020? Almost about a year ago. Okay, a year ago. Okay. So what made you choose that journey? Because first of all, I mean, you can put it into more context for us, but it's so hard. It is the most prestigious designation to earn in the world of wine. You know, it's got this low, low pass rate of, like, I don't know what it is, 10, 15%. Takes years, thousands of dollars. Why did you decide to go on that journey? You know, I'm just generally someone that likes to push myself to keep learning. So part of it was that I'm sure Amanda can relate to this too, coming from also a, you know, arts background and that like, you have to have a lot of self-discipline to keep practicing on your own, you know, to get up each day and whether it's, you know, go take a bar class or, you know, go um, take a voice lesson or practice on your own or study music. And so I just had this sort of both learned, but also instinctual thing where I just always like to be sort of working towards something. And 
have a very good friend, Mary Margaret McCammock, who's an MW who had started the program. And so I heard a lot about it from her. But I think also I just at that point, I was working at a winery and managing their mailing list and hospitality. And as always, I was bugging everyone in the cellar with questions about like, tell me more about SO2 or, you know, let's talk about pH and all these things I just really wanted to know. And for me, the master of wine was the most sort of holistic way to learn all these things because you do have to learn viticulture, vinification, you have to understand legalities and marketing of wine and current topics and how to communicate all these things together and use critical thinking to do so. So for me, it just was a way to kind of combine all of those like pieces of curiosity and then sort of feed this fire inside of me, which is this like constant desire to keep learning. I love that pieces of curiosity. What do you think is the primary difference between, say, the Master of Wine and the other prestigious designation, Master Sommelier? Yeah, I mean, the Master Sommelier is an intensely difficult exam as well. There's a couple of key differences. One is the Master Sommelier exam does include a service element where the Master of Wine does not. So I would describe the Master Sommelier as really perfectly geared towards someone who is going to be working on a restaurant floor, working with wine lists. Whereas the MW, it's a little bit more broad in terms of what a career might look like. You know, it could be a writer, it could be a winemaker, could also be a sommelier. It sort of appeals to sort of a, a broader swath of types of people in the industry. Another key difference would be that everything in the Master of Wine is written, whereas all of the examinations are spoken, or most of them in the Master Sommelier exam. One thing that I do really appreciate about the Master of Wine also is that because everything is written, you are anonymous when you test. So the person who is going to be grading your paper is not in the room with you. You're just a number. It gets shipped off to London and graded by someone you don't know who it is. They don't know who you are. So I really appreciated the sort of fairness of that, of that, you know, whoever actually is going to be deciding whether you pass or fail doesn't know whether you're black, white, a male or female, how old you are, what you were wearing that day, any of those types of things. So I really liked that it was a very level playing field in that well, sense. That's interesting. And the Master of Wine seems a bit more academic leaning and Master Sommelier very much more like hands-on practical, like as you said, like for the restaurant versus someone who's maybe going into some other aspect of the wine industry. Right. And I do think, again, of the master sommelier is, is so perfectly suited to someone really wanting to pursue that service element in the restaurant floor that I believe there's sort of more sort of factual recall, whereas the master of wine really asks you to take everything that you know and put it in an essay form and then prove your point, almost argue it as if you know you were a lawyer or a detective and then prove your point like a lawyer. So you really have to use critical thinking and tie in knowledge of all aspects of the wine industry and then be able to communicate well as well. Oh, that's great. I wanted to sort of switch gears a little bit. And Amanda, our listeners and viewers tonight are curious about what are the new wine styles that we should be looking at? Like, there's so many trendy wines. I love your take on some of them. Like, let's throw out some of them. Orange wines. What are your thoughts? Like, should we be trying them? Do you think they're a fad? Are they here to stay? Well, I don't think that they're a fad. I mean, we've had orange wine in Italy for quite some time now and in other regions as well where you have a little skin contact. But I do think that orange wine in the United States has sort of become a fad of sorts. We've seen some really good examples and we've seen some not great examples, but I think it's such a small, narrow niche that uh, it hasn't really broken into the mass market. And for people that are really sort of obsessed with wine, I love that they can go down that rabbit hole. But you know, for consumers that have no idea what it is, I think it can be a dangerous thing because they hear orange wine and they don't have all, all the tools to understand what that means. And going back to what you had asked before about demystifying wine, well, it's hard to get consumers to understand very complicated wine concepts. And so trying to explain to someone what an orange wine is requires a lot of backstory and how wine is made. So, um, you know, is it a fad? Uh, maybe here in the U.S. or I think it's here to stay? Probably not, you know, in a large degree, but maybe in a smaller degree. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Vanessa, whether you want to add to those comments or tell us what your opinion is on another trendy wine, say natural or raw wines. What about those? <laughs> I mean, there's definitely, a, it's very trendy, natural wine. I think what's confusing is there really isn't a clear definition of what that involves to qualify as natural. So I think that there's a lot of natural confusion with what that means. And I think there's been some stigma sort of over wines that aren't billed as natural when actually the two could be made quite similarly and one is marketed a certain way and, and one isn't. So 
I don't think that that's going anywhere. I, I think that people are very curious about what is part of the process, just like they are with food. They want to know all, all the ingredients, you know, how animals were handled, how they were raised. So I think it's only natural that people are asking these questions. I just think that as a wine community, we need to do a better job of helping to explain what that actually means and what people should look for. And what is a natural wine then for you? And how would you, if you would, differentiate it from, say, a raw wine? Because there isn't a definition. I mean, I would say, you know, where I worked at a luxury wine estate in Napa Valley, we were certified organically farmed, but we're not natural because, of course, there's some sort of laws that apply about things in the winery that disqualify that. But in terms of how the wine was made, it was very minimally intervention. You know, there was a tiny, tiny bit of SO2, and that was really it. So, I mean, to me, that qualifies as basically a natural wine. I think some people would say, well, that little bit of SO2 for consistency and bottling, maybe that disqualifies it. So I can't really say what the definition is because there isn't <laughs> there isn't one. Um, so until we sort of codify it, it's a very difficult topic. And that's, again, why I feel like we do need to do some work here as wine professionals to help consumers really understand and so that they're getting what they want in the end. Yeah. And SO2, sulfur dioxide, to help preserve the wine, to stabilize it, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And do you folks at Wine Access, do you sell these types of wines? Or like, what are you seeing as popular these days in terms of wines? You know, we see, we sell all types of wine. I would say as a category, natural wine is not one that we have rolled up our sleeves on. And I will say, again, because there isn't a clear definition and because I do want my wines to be shelf stable and ship stable, and I want a customer to have consistency. If someone buys six bottles, I want the six bottle to be what they had in the first bottle as well. So do we sell wines that are very minimally or maybe none? Yes, but it's not necessarily a category I'm seeking out. We taste every bottle before we offer it. So any wine has to sort of prove that it's up to our standards to offer. But in terms of what sells, we see all categories. I will say one thing that's been kind of fun to see is during lockdown, there's been a lot of sort of very crisp white wine lots of these great little racy wines like from Italy. We just can't keep around. I don't want to tell you other than I think that happy hour starts a little sooner (laughs) these days. And maybe people are looking for something kind of refreshing for what might be considered a little bit of day drinking, which, you know, I'm not judging, but that's, that's just sort of been interesting to see that. (laughs) So the lower alcohol and you're not asleep by seven on the sofa, (laughs) you know, crisp, easy drinking, an oat, wines have have been definitely seen a an increase. Oh wow. And either of you feel free to answer these questions, but I'm just curious because you sell so many wines and have over the years, what's been the most expensive wine that you've ever sold? Oh, Amanda's got to take this one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> the most expensive wine we ever sold was a Magnum of the 1969 Chapelet, which is an incredibly rare unicorn bottle. If it's in 750, if it's a Magnum, forget it. Like I'll see that once in my life. But that was a wine that went for $10,000 before we even got it in the door. We already knew who we were selling it to. So, And that's a Rhone Valley wine? Oh, no, that was Napa Valley. It was uh, the Chapelet on... Chapelet. Okay. Yeah, Chapelet on Pritchard Hill. So it's considered one of the best wines, if not the best wine ever made in Napa Valley alongside like a 1974 Heights Martha's. Oh, my goodness. It was made by Philippe Tongi, who was trained by Emile Pinot. So crazy pedigree. But then on top of that, you know, just great history that makes this wine really, really iconic in Napa Valley's history. How did you guys source that? Like, did you get it directly from the winery? I mean, how would you get such a rare bottle to sell? We're, I say this, you know, with a grain of salt, but I think to some degree we're lucky in Napa Valley that we don't have the amount of fraud that other regions like Burgundy and Bordeaux have. We do absolutely have it. This particular wine was sourced from a private seller. So it was sourced by my then boss, Scott Brenner, who knew the person who had bought it originally. And we also, having relationships with the wineries being in Napa Valley, we were able to corroborate those stories. So it was someone that had purchased it sort of early on. And we knew that there were only about 10 in existence. And we also knew where the others were located. So Wow. And how about the the oddest or the most unicorn bottle that you've ever sold, if there is such a a thing. (laughs) Any very weird bottles? Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think like we've had some old 
like Inglenook used to make Turbono, um, Martini used to make Barbera. Like there's some really old, cool varieties that we never really see in Napa Valley anymore. Charbona's actually started to make a comeback. Like if you want to talk about a trend, <laughs> that's actually a trend in Napa Valley right now, which is also known as Bernarda in South America and typically blended with Malbec. But yeah, some of these like really odd varieties from like the 50s and 60s that, you know, were really fun to put on the list miraculously stood the test of time. And those are generally my most favorite to sell. <laughs> that's great. What tips would you give? Like, obviously, you run a wine club, so you're advising people all the time on which wines to choose. But for people who are, say, looking at your selection or walking into a liquor store, what are your best tips on how to buy wine, especially if you want to get out of a wine rut? You're always going to the same bottle. It's safe. You know you like it. But you want to try something new. So at Wine Access, you don't actually have to be part of a club to buy wine from us. So we have a daily offer which is, you know, wine sold by email. There's a store. We do have three tiers of wine club if you like to buy that way, which is actually, I think, a great way to learn more because you get a variety of wines to try. And with the club, we actually have a theme for every quarter. I think to back up for one second, I think that sometimes wine clubs have a bad rap. It sometimes can be a place to sort of make wine go away. <laughs> yeah, where bad wines go to die. <laughs> Right, that aren't being sold through other channels. That's absolutely not what we do. We hold every wine up to the same standards that we do for any of the channels. But additionally, we choose a theme for each quarter. Like we've done up and coming winemakers. We had a theme old world versus new world. I'm actually filming some videos later today about it. The entire club is on Italy for this quarter. So it's very educational. You know, we write at extended write-ups, 500 to 1,000 word write-ups about every wine. With the club, as I mentioned, we also film videos so you can taste with us. So I'd say we go to great lengths, actually. We think about this very, very seriously, how to appeal to the novice all the way to the expert um, through content, through the written word and through video content. To answer your question about how to try new things, something that we also do is, let's say we're going to write about a Gruner Veltliner. Maybe nobody's, someone's reading this offer has never had it before. We do try to go to, of course, describe the wine, but also say, you know, for people who like wines like, you know, Sancerre, Albarino, you know, crisp, high acid wines to sort of help you understand the style so that if you know one of those other categories, you might, you might know what to expect in the bottle and the glass. But I think if you're not buying wine from Wine Access, which of course I hope you will, I think just starting to ask questions kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. And whether it's at a, your shop or, you know, people on the floor, whether it's a restaurant or retail should know better than anybody, you know, what's on that list or on the shelves. And so really start to talk to them and ask what's interesting to them and just take a risk ultimately drink promiscuously. <laughs> drink promiscuously. I love that. <laughs> And consider the source though, like know where you're going to be buying wine from. I don't think anybody goes to the gas station expecting to buy sushi and not feel sick later. And maybe that's a <laughs> bad example, but like, I think if you want to try something new and you expect it to be good, go to a reputable wine shop that has, to Vanessa's point, people working there who have considered the wines, who've curated the wines, who can help tell that story and help you navigate that. You know, if you walk into like a corner gas station liquor shop, it's highly unlikely that you're one, going to find what you like and two, find anything different. So I always say consider the source. That's true. And when I'm in a good restaurant, I'll trust the server or Psalm's recommendation of wine by the glass. I will try something, but not maybe at you know, fast food joint or whatever. But I love also that tip of if this, then that. I like this, I like that. So what do you recommend? That's also a good tip for people trying to get out of their wine rut. So I also uh, heard or read where you were doing a high altitude tasting, right? You were taking wines planted at high altitudes and doing a video tasting of those. Oh, that was part of a winemaking techniques. Yes. Or winemaking influences club that we did. And that was one of them. So we had a number of things we featured. One was actual things that the winemakers can do. So what is malolactic fermentation? How do you find that in a wine? What would you taste? What would you look for? And we explained that. And then we also did things about sort of where vines are planted. So yes, like high altitude or a hillside where it was part of the club as well. And then of course we explained, you know, what you might find, what considerations went into the planting, the harvesting, all those different things, and then tie it back to what impact it would have in the glass. So a little mini course. That was a really fun video too, because we got to hear everyone's sort of perspective on high altitude, which were all sort of similar in the same theme, but everyone had different words. Like I'll never forget Eduardo described it as like licking a battery, which I cannot <laughs> get out of my mind. No. 
Not <laughs> looking about because of the acidity? No, because it's like electric. Like he was like, it just feels electric. Okay. And I was like, you know, that's a great description for someone who doesn't. <laughs> I'm thinking battery acid. <laughs> I mean, if you've ever licked a battery, which I haven't, but you know, I didn't <laughs> forget true. it. <laughs> On the same subject, when I'm teaching wine and food pairing, I'll say, smell everything, like the furniture, the leather chair. Just don't let someone catch you doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Instead of licking batteries, smelling chairs. But anyway, go ahead. (laughs) Oh, no, I was just going to say, Eduardo, who Amanda references on the wine team at Wine Access, and he has the most wonderful expressions in terms of phrase, in terms of describing wine. I think one of my favorites was, I feel like I just won a game and have a group of cheerleaders carrying me away on their shoulders. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Yeah, Yeah. I love that that description. Okay, well, let's just look at some photos because I do want to share those with our audience. There we go. Is this Amanda? (laughs) That's me. (laughs) The ballet days. I just wanted to, because we've been talking about some of these things. That's lovely. Which ballet was this? Oh, that's the classic. It's the Nutcracker, of course. <laughs> oh, right. There you go. The background. Right. Yep. That's Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy towards the end. Nice. Were you the Sugar Plum Fairy? That year I was Clara. Not in that picture, but the year before I, I had played Clara. I don't know what I was dancing there. <laughs> okay. That's where I was Clara. <laughs> oh, is this you in the middle? That's me, the little one, the little girl. Oh, right there. Clara, yes. Yeah. So sweet. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And then we have Vanessa with La Bohème, La Bohème. La Bohème, yes. This is an updated production. So they set the time frame differently than when it was originally written. But yes, this is backstage on Broadway. So Baz Luhrmann, the movie director, also directed this production. So Oh, fantastic. (laughs) We were various people about to go on stage and be a part of a scene in Paris of Christmas Eve. And so this is, you know, some of the characters you might uh, encounter on the street that night. I love that hat. (laughs) Love your hat. <laughs> and this is you with your Yay. MW. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Thank Graduating, you. looking relieved. <laughs> yes. Well, I took this photo in my home because uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, the annual ceremony in London was canceled. And you're an MW the day that they call you, but the actual giving of the certificate, normally you receive that at a ceremony in London. And I bought the dress and the shoes for the ceremony, which didn't happen, but then they mailed the certificate. So I decided I would just put it on anyway. <laughs> Beautiful dress. Absolutely. Why not? <laughs> yeah. And for those who are listening to the podcast version of this, you'll have to come over to the video version and take a look because these photos are terrific. And back to Amanda. Is this at press? This is at press. This is when I chopped all my hair off and poured my comments by the glass. <laughs> There you go. Actually, no, I don't know if that was. <laughs> yeah, that was at press. I was working as a sommelier. That was for an article that I was featured in called Liquid Diet for Food and Wine Magazine. And they chronicled every single thing that I drank in a week, which if you can imagine is a lot of wine, a lot of coffee and a lot of champagne. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and where is this, Amanda? Oh, this was actually something I got to do with Vanessa. This was like our first on-camera appearance, oh, yeah. I think. It was. Together. <laughs> okay. We did this thing. Is it blind? T- is it just called blind tasting on um, blind, blind tasting, tasting sessions. sessions? Sessions on some TV. So she and I blinded each other on two wines. So I have the Edge Hill Chardonnay, which is made from the oldest vines in the Bocce Gluti Vineyard, which were in the original Judgment of Paris wine for the Chateau Montalina, and then the one on the right there. That's a 1977 or 79. I forget. I think it's 77. Joseph Phelps Isley Vineyard. So very famous vineyard that the Arahos uh, purchased in early 90s and now is under new ownership and just called Isley Vineyard, but one of my favorites. So Vanessa was great. She nailed them. Oh, did she? And blind tasting, like identifying them without seeing the label. Amanda nailed her wines too, might I add. So. <laughs> this is Vanessa and I stealing wine from the cellar. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got caught. You're looking happy about it though. <laughs> Where is this? Is this the wine access cellar? No, this is at Press. This is oh, our wine cellar. Okay. So this was actually only about half of our cellar. On the other side, in front of us, there were two other glass enclosed cellars. But I used to have this series there called Sunday School at Press, where we'd invite wine professionals to sit down and, and sort of do a round table with like 15 people. And Vanessa was nice enough to be one of our guests. I think you brought some, is that some like Raveneau Petit Chablis or something? I did. I brought a magnum of Raveneau Petit Chablis. Yeah, that was very kind of you. Very generous. Very generous. Oh, my goodness. And this is you tasting at a winery somewhere. 
this is the blind tasting sessions in action. So I think that yeah. you can see that look on my face. I'm sort of waiting with anticipation to see <laughs> what like, Amanda's going to say. There, go there. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda's thinking about it. I'm like, is it the Onye or is it something else? <laughs> Same tasting session. That's Jason Wise. Who oh, from Some TV. Films. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Those are great to watch too for those who are interested. This must be shipping wine access products, is it? No, these are actually, this This was a little thing that I did for the holidays. I did a gift giving guide. And so these are my favorite wine glasses. These are the Mark Thomas double bends that I was talking about. Which glasses are these again? They're called Mark Thomas. He was a consultant for Zalto. So they sort of have the same weight and feel of a Zalto, but they've got more of a roundness to them. So they're great for California wines. One of the things that I don't like about Zaltos is they make California wines angular and a little bit disjointed. So this actually sort of solved that problem, giving you the roundness, but also like really giving the wines a lift and brightness, which, you know, for some people, they're like, oh, glassware doesn't really matter. I think it does. So. Oh, I do too. And I use Zalto. So I'm curious to try these, Amanda. And so what do you mean by it makes the wine angular? We think of Napa wines as being many different things, but I think because we have such great weather and it, it, the wines are often very sun-kissed and have an element of fruit, sometimes the angularity of that glass can really sort of mute that. It can mute the sun-kissed nature and the softness of those wines and make some of the angularity of those wines more pronounced, which in some cases you want, you know, certainly some older wines that lean more on like their savory notes. But for some of the more youthful California wines that have more denseness and juiciness and suppleness, I find that it can really disjoint the wine and actually make some of the alcohol sort of poke through a little bit and, and make the tannin sort of like too zappy on your palate, if that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. No, I like that. Zappy. I, I'm definitely going to try these glasses. I'm curious now. And this is you somewhere traveling. Yeah, this is at Maya Thomas. I think this is actually my first official duty as wine director. So when I was promoted from somebody to wine director, I hired a new team and these were my First two hires, Jody and Carrie, and one of my favorites in Napa. And here we are at a chateau in Bordeaux. Is this when you had like a weekend off between Napa and New York? Yeah, this is my getaway, my jaunt to Bordeaux. This is me like living my best life. And I think that was at a Chateau Palmer in Margo. The turrets from the label. Absolutely. Beautiful. And the two of you, is this Silver Oak or where is this? Yes. yes. Yeah, that is Silver Oak. Okay. <laughs> I see the label. We talk about Silver Oak a lot, not because we design it that way, but because it is such a beloved winery. We joke that they should be a sponsor of our podcast because every guest <laughs> that we have on is like either says their favorite wine is Silver Oak or Opus One or like have some story about that. So we thought it'd be fun to take some promotional shots there. And then after Silver Oak invited <laughs> us to do their release party. So it all kind of came full circle. So we have a great relationship with them. And Vanessa has a great relationship with the Duncan family as well. Oh, fantastic. Just a couple more. This is, ah, this is La Chapelle. Yes, in Hermitage. So Okay, so that's what I thought I was hearing earlier from the yeah, Napa. Exactly. It's not a tombstone. I know it looks like it. it's just, <laughs> yeah, you're sitting on the winemaker's grave. <laughs> no, it's just a marker, I promise you. But yeah, so that's, of course, in the Northern Rhone on atop the hill of Hermitage. And that was during this intense heat wave. So not pictured is me almost passing out shortly after this photo was taken. <laughs> Uh, here you're filming for the wine club. Yes. So yeah, in, in fact, that's that's Eduardo, who I mentioned before, and I'll be with him later today filming our wine club videos about this quarter, which is on Italy. So yes, we sit down, as you can see in this photo, we taste all the wines together. We talk through our experience with the wine, what we might need to know, of course, or might want to know, I should say, and then um, yeah, and then share them out. So it's always a really fun day. I think this is the last one of the photos that I have. So who's this? That's me with Josh Hart, who's an NBA player for the Pelicans in New Orleans, who has become a personal friend of mine. He's really curious about wine. He's become a collector, but very, very open. And he's, what I really like about him is he's never afraid to admit what he doesn't know or ask questions, which I think kind of goes back to one of our previous questions, right, that you had for us is how to learn is to never be embarrassed to ask a question. So I get a lot of sort of text messages about what's this bottle and what does this mean? And when should I open this? And it's been really fun for me. But I think the more important thing to know about Josh is that Wine Access and Josh partnered on a scholarship for diversity in the wine business. Ah, so we gave away terrific 100 scholarships for Black and Indigenous people of color. So we've taught three, we broke them into four sessions. We've taught three of them. And then the fourth one is actually I'll be teaching tomorrow. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a great note to 
and on for the pictures. Again, I just can't believe how quickly the time has flown. And I still have 56 questions to ask you both. So <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> don't don't go. But you have kindly offered to give 15% off Wine Access orders for the first three people that go to wineaccess.com forward slash unreserved, as in unreserved wine talk, the title of this podcast. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to mention now? Well, I will just say it's been a pleasure to be on this podcast. Any time I get to spend with Vanessa, which as of late has been with some regularity because of our podcast, Wine Access Unfiltered, is, is a good one. So thank you. Terrific. Absolutely. And where can we find you both online? Well, obviously, wineaccess.com, but are there any other things you want to share from social or websites, that sort of thing? I know, Amanda, you have a YouTube channel. Yeah, that's actually my primary job these days. So I left the restaurant industry just before COVID last year, completely unrelated to focus primarily on making content for YouTube and Instagram. So I'm at Som Vivant, so S-O-M-M-V-I-V-A-N-T. So I create wine-focused content, sometimes non-wine-focused content, but always just you know with the consumer in mind, how I drink, how I'd want to be taught when I was you know 25 or 26 in New York City. So that's where you can find me. You can find the Wine Access Unfiltered podcast on every platform and then also on Instagram at Wine Access Unfiltered. And then I'm sure Vanessa's got some social media handles she can share. For sure. So for Wine Access on Instagram, just at Wine Access. And then mine's pretty easy. My personal is at Vanessa Conlon. So just my first and last name on Instagram. And then we do have a Facebook group called the Wine Access Experience, where we also post content, et cetera, there. So that's where you can find us. And of course, as you mentioned online, wineaccess.com. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you both for being with us on the podcast. I wish you all the best. I'm looking forward to chatting with you on your podcast. And I hope that our listeners will find you on all of those various channels and your podcast, your website, your YouTube. But thank you both. Vanessa, Amanda, this has been a real treat. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Take care. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Amanda and Vanessa. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I love the way Vanessa described the Master of Wine Studies as a way to combine all those pieces of her curiosity and to feed her constant desire to keep learning. I feel that way when it comes to writing my books and articles and researching guests and topics for this podcast. Two, I agree with her that we in the wine community need to do a better job of explaining what natural wine actually means and what you should look for when you're buying one. And three, I love her advice to drink promiscuously. The people on the floor, whether it's restaurant sommeliers or retail wine staff, they know better than anybody what's on the list or on the shelves. Talk to them. Ask them what's interesting. Take a risk. Drink promiscuously. In the show notes, you'll find a full transcript of our conversation how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, where you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 120. You won't want to miss next week when we turn the tables and Zach Gabal, the host and producer of the Vine Pair podcast, interviews me. Zach is a wine writer, educator, and certified sommelier based in Seattle. I'll be interviewing Zach in an upcoming episode as well. In the meantime, if you missed episode eight, go back and take a listen. I talk about the scandalous wine women on television. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Brooding dark red wines do pair better with political intrigue than whites. Plus, chilled white wine can mist over with condensation in the glass, which would be unsightly. Liv and the president's chief of staff, Cyrus Bean, also enjoy a glass or two while discussing rigging elections and other matters. She once opened for him, quote, a Bordeaux that will bring tears to your eyes, end quote. Meanwhile, First Lady Melly Grant tells Liv over lunch with beautiful menace, I know how you love your wine. They're arch rivals, not least because her philandering husband, President Fitzgerald Grant III is in love with Liv.
But Liv's most serious love affair is with red wine, alone, in her apartment. Wine is mostly used to drink away the stress at the end of the day. It's a coping mechanism. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially one you know who'd be interested in the tips that Amanda and Vanessa shared. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.